If God would ask you to do something, would you do it? Or would you test God and ask Him, how do I know if you got it? It's asking me to do this. You know, a lot of strange things go through our mind sometimes when we don't understand. So can one person make a difference? Yes. No matter how small he is or how insignificant he is or what he is, if he's in good health or bad health or whatever, if God chooses him, he can make a difference. But you know, a lot of times I think people are chosen, but they don't realize that it's God that chose them. They sort of wonder, did he really tell me to do this? Or did the devil tell me to do this? Sometimes it's difficult to understand the difference between the two. So what we're going to talk about today is a little story in here, and it's in the book of Judges. So if you want to open your book to Judges, chapter 6. Okay, would somebody read verse 1? And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them unto the hand of my God seven years. Okay, somebody read verse 2. And the hand of Gideon prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which were in the mountains, and the caves, and the stronghold. Now, if you know anything about the Middle East, you know that a lot of the rock, there's a lot of the caves and stuff made out of the water because the type of rocks it is, it's uh, limestone motion. So there's a lot of caves in the mountains because of limestone formations and the water running through the limestone. So there's plenty of places for them to hide. Okay, would somebody read verse 3? And so it was when Israel had sown that the Medanites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them. Somebody read uh, verse 4. And they encamped again, even the sword Okay, somebody go ahead and read number five. Well, they came up with the cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude, for both they and their, and their camels were with that number, and they even to the land to destroy it. So what it is, these people was coming up to Israel, and they were stealing everything they raised. They were stealing their cattle, they were stealing their food. They were stealing everything they got. A lot of people in Israel got so scared that they went up in the mountains and found caves to live in because they were afraid that they were going to be destroyed by the Amalekites. So there's where we are now. Okay, but somebody read uh, 6. Yeah, Israel was greatly discouraged because of the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. So may read seven. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the many nights. So Israel got so depressed about everybody coming in and stealing everything you had, even though that they sinned against the Lord, now all of a sudden they turn into the Lord. Does that sound like today? As long as you got everything you want and you're happy and everything's going good, you, you just don't even think about the Lord. But the minute something goes bad and you need somebody to turn to, well, who do you turn to? You turn to the Lord. Standard, 
Mm -hmm. You know, that's just like going to church. As long as everything's going good, why go to church? That's how a lot of people look at it. A lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm saved at home. I don't need to go to church. But going to church is where you learn. Going to church is where you make brothers and sisters. Going to church is where you talk to people about God that understands what you're talking about. You can go out in the world. Some people know a little bit about the Bible. But most of them don't think twice about it because they're of the world. And they're living of the world. Did somebody read verse 9? And I deliver you out of all the hands of the Egyptians and out of the hands of all the oppressed youth and babes and back out from before you and gave you the land. Okay, somebody read the letter. And I said it to you, man, and the Lord your God, through the, the God of the Amorite, in, in which land you dwell, but <coughs> they have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and said unto the oak which was in Orpha, and the same unto Joshua, the representative of Zebrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the wine of bread to get it from the Midianites. Now that's why we were going through this pretty quick. I wanted to get to Gideon. So Gideon was just a young man sitting there threshing wheat, trying to stay out of sight of the Midianites, which was stealing everything they had. So the Lord, uh, an angel of the Lord, Otherwise called the angel of his presence. Isaiah 63, 9. For the angel of the Lord we have simply the Lord. An oak, rather an oak, for there abideth as it should be remembered. It was doubtless a well-known tree still standing in the writer's time compared to a mention of the oak and in Genesis 35, 4, the great oath in which Adam was caught. And Judges 45, their, their seed oversee the simple way in which the ministration of an angel introduced as if it were a matter of course in the eyes of him, who the Lord of the millions of heavenly hosts, those ministers who did so pleasure, human temptation, the twin sister of human selfishness, which blot out the creation except itself, to hide it, etc. These graphic torches give lively picture to the straits to which the Israelites were reduced by the Midianites' occupation. So the Midianites, what they were doing, they were coming into Israel, they were stealing everything they got. They were killing them, taking the children, and just totally doing whatever they wanted. They couldn't stop them. Sounds a lot like certain places today. Somebody read Judges 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Okay, this is a young man here that was hiding from the many dikes. And now the Lord called him a young man of valor. Okay, verse 12. 13. 13. <laughs> And Gideon said unto him, O oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all these miracles which our father told us of saying? Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of men at night. Yeah. Israel was just brought up out of Egypt. <laughs> the Israelites complained the whole time on their journey out of Egypt. They complained to the Lord the whole time. They didn't believe nothing. They didn't care about nothing. Then they went, uh, he got up to the bottom of the mountain. Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments and come back. They done made a golden calf to worship and forgot about God again. So half the Israelites were destroyed. Because God was so mad he was going to destroy them all, but Moses talked him out of it. 
So Israel has been doing bad things all along. As long as everything was going good, it's all right. As long as things were going good, everything was perfect. But the minute things got out of hand, they called on the Lord. And that sounds so common today. Actually, they took it in their own hands, right? Huh? They took it in their own hands. They didn't really even call on the Lord. They just took it in their own hands and started doing what they thought was right. Yeah. They did it to themselves. But you know, a lot of times, when you read a lot of these things about the Bible, it's like the Israelites, you know, the Israelites, I don't try to, they didn't even try to fight the Mennonites, did they? They just give in. Just with some submitted to them. They're reading and running and hiding everything. But you know, as bad as that the Israelites done because of the many things that they done that were so wrong. It was wrong. You yeah. gotta remember one thing. God gave them a way out. Absolutely. When they turned the circuits in there to bite, you know, to, to kill them, mm -hmm. he gave them a way out. He'll give all of us a way out. No matter what. True. They're supposed to be in the, in the wilderness, so it's so true. They ended up there for 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, you, know, a, a lot of times, you know, a lot of times in our life, there's a lot of things we could do ourselves that the Lord give us the strength to do for ourselves, but we don't do it. We sit back and call on Him to do it for us. And I think a lot of times the Israelites did the same thing. They didn't want to do nothing themselves. They wanted the Lord to do it all for them. Okay, somebody read verse 14. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, that thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not a can't they? Okay, somebody read 15. And he said unto them, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. So this is what we're talking about, the least of my father's house. How many times do we feel that way? We're the least of anything. I'm sure most all of us have been there. I know when I sat in the back row back there one time, and I was just sat back there because I didn't feel worthy of doing anything to the church or for the church. Because I felt that I was I didn't deserve anything, I was the least of everything. And then, then one day he talked to me and he said, Don't sit back here no more. I want you to get up and do something. And for two or three days it was hard on my heart. He wanted me to get up and do something. So that may not be the best of what I do, but I got up and I done something. So now I'm trying to teach you a little bit, and I know I'm not the best teacher. Okay. Uh, no, wait a minute, I'm talking to you, uh, but uh -huh. you think about this, about what he's saying here. He, what he's doing, he's trying to give God an excuse. Mm -hmm. I, I'm too weak, I can't do this. That's it. Well, I think about people coming to church. That's the way we are. We can sit, we say, well, I can't come to church. Well, I don't feel good. I got out yesterday done and I'm too tired. We can think of all the excuses we want for not going to church, for not doing the things that we should do. But one day, each and every one of us is going to stand before judgment. For the good and the bad, you need to think about that. Soon. The good and the bad, we're going to be judged for that. Yeah, we're going to have to answer for what we do. Okay, somebody read 17. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the men and life as one man. So maybe he said it to him. He said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. 18. Report not again, I pray thee, until I come unto thee, and bring forth my presence and set it for thee. And he said, I will carry it until I come again. Okay, go ahead and read that And Gideon went in and made ready a kit and a loaf unleavened cake of the essence of the flour of the flesh, the flesh 
he put in the basket and he put the broth in the pot and brought it out and threw him under the oak and he did it. Hey, read 19. That was 19. That was 19. Yeah. Okay. Read 20. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Read 20. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Okay, what did that verse say? What's the meaning? You have the meaning for it? He was sacrificed and the fire from heaven, wasn't it? Okay, somebody read that. 22. And the beginning perceived that it was the angel of the Lord, the beginning said, I have, O Lord God, for because I have seen the ring of the Lord face to face. Now sometimes we don't believe that Mr. Chief was going to die in the Gideon didn't believe it to be seen with his own eyes. He had to see it to actually to believe it. Well, what did you tell us? Hmm? Where we entertain angels unaware. Right. True. That is a good, right? From the kids, that's a good, right? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly the part of the good. And then I cook it for them. That's the good part. That goes back to the good. Okay, yeah. Uh, Read 23. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. Read 24. And Gideon built him altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah, Shalom. And to this day it is yet in the fortress of the Abrisiites. Uh -huh. Can I read 24? Everybody. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bull, even the second bull, and even the seven year old, and throw down the altar of Baal, by the father hath, and cut down the grove that is by him. Okay, 26. Build an altar unto the Lord, my God, for the top of the rock. In the order of the clothes, and set the second full rock, and offer the burnt off, burnt backwards with wood, and the wood with thou shalt cut down, thou shalt cut down. The rock rendered the keep of the stronghold as offering, for also the high place was, just as the temple was in the stronghold of Zorn. And the hold of the house of Baal. It was the cathedral of the place. In the order of place, the meaning of this place is uncertain. It may either be rendered as the AV meaning on the level ground, ordering and preparing for the building of the altar. So maybe 27. Then the Gideon took the ten men of his servants and did as the Lord said unto them, and so it was. Because he feared his father's household and the men of the city, that he could not do this by day that he did it by night. He had to do it by night because he was afraid to do it during the day, afraid of what people might say. 327. And when the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down, and the grove was cut down, that was by it, and the second bullet was offered upon the altar that was built. Okay, then 28. Then they said one to another, Who hath done this? And when they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Josh, have done this thing. Okay, 30. 
then the men of the city said unto Joab, Bring out the son that we may that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by him. So uh, how what did that tell you about the Israelites? They had an altar of Baal? It's false prophets, it's false. That's how far they went to the evil ways, wasn't it? And they were willing to kill the man because he messed with the altar. Okay, read 31. Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death. While it is yet morning, if it be a God, let him plead for himself, because one has cast down his altar. Chapter 31. Therefore on that day he called him Jer Jeroboam, Baal, saying this, Baal plead against him because he had thrown down his altar. Okay, read 32. It was 32. Okay, read 33. Yeah. Then all the Canaanites and the Ancalites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Okay, tell me, read 34. The Spirit of God came up on Gideon and he blew a trumpet. Be as, be as, was gathered after him. 835. And he sent the message throughout all the nations, who also gathered after him. And he sent messages unto Asher, and unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali. And they came up to meet him. 36. And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save me for thine hand, as thou hast said. Okay, good. 37. Behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the floor, in the floor, I'm sorry, with the duty on the fleece only, and with the dry on all the earth beside. Then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by my hand, as thou hast said. So what is this saying here? Did you still don't believe this God? Right. Like the body else looking for a sign. Mm -hmm. He's still going to have another sign from God, doesn't he? Right. The first couple of signs he got, he didn't pay no attention or he didn't believe, and now he wants another sign. Okay, so maybe 37. Was that 37 with your three? Yeah. Good 38. And it was so, for he rose up early in the, in the morning. He pressed the fleece together and wringed the dew out of it, a bowl, a bowl full of water. Well, the ground was dry, it was in the desert. But the fleece had a bowl of water in it, and the ground was dry all the way around. That's a sign. That was a sign, wasn't it? Was it a good enough sign? Would that be a good enough sign for you? It'd be very believing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Read 39, real slow. And Gideon said unto God, Let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak, but this once let me prove, I pray thee. But this once with the fleece, let it now be dry only upon the fleece, and upon all the ground that there be due. So he still wasn't satisfied, was he? How many times do you have to see a miracle before you believe it? It's <coughs> a miracle every day when you wake every up. Every day of life is a miracle. Wake up breathing, that's a miracle. That's a miracle when you wake up. Yep. But Gideon just seems like a young man if it's a uh, I just got to keep seeing miracles of what I'm going to believe in. Well, let's see what else happens to Gideon. Read 40. Okay. God did so that night 
where it was dry upon the fleece only, and there was dew on all the grain. Well, he got another miracle, didn't he? Yep. Gideon, uh, Gideon was just a, a young man, more or less a, a nobody in the village. He's not very impressed at the first lift, but he makes some choices in place from the faith of God. So significant is the mark this very ordinary man made in his time that he is listed in Hebrews 11, alongside the movers and the shakers of the Old Testament tracks his story with me as we work our way through Judges 6 7, where we find a prayer mirror on trusting God. There are six lessons here to help us trust God more. So that's why I went into this Judges on this number six. I wanted to get to the six to the beginning to so you can understand where it was going through. So what we're talking about, verse 1, God uses tough times to get our attention. This is Judges 1 through 6. As we open Judges 6, we find the nation of Israel coming off a time of related deeds. But bills are paid and kids are behaving and business is good. Everything's coming to roses. And as it tends to happen to all of us at such times, Israel forgot God. They become self-sufficient and they didn't need God. So the Lord shook things up by rousing an enemy against them to show them how hard life can be without them. Don't we face this every day? You can be sitting around and sitting along and everything's going just like roses and everything's private, absolutely perfect, no problems, nothing wrong with the world. Not a care in the world, and all of a sudden somebody drops a hammer on you. Your whole world turns upside down, and you don't know what to do or where to go or where to turn to. That's the way life is. And that's what God's telling you. Even in the good times, you have to read and love God. God is there for the good times, God is there for the bad times. He's going to be there all the time. And he'll be there for you as long as you want it. But the Bible also says if you turn your back and walk away from God, God will turn his back and walk away from you. So we need to keep that in mind. Verse 1 says that the Israelites did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord handed them over to the Midian for seven years. You need to know that the Midianites were extremely powerful and oppressive the Israelites mercifully. Every year around harvest time, the nomadic Hadeadite would invade Israel and tells us that they would come like the locusts ravaging the land. Has anybody ever seen locusts in the Middle East? I've never been to the Middle East. <laughs> well, I checked up on the locusts in the Middle East. When the locust swarms come over, it just turns dark as night because there's no sun. They're so thick, the light can't get through them. So this is what the Israelites is facing. This went on for seven years. Finally, the Israelites cried out to the Lord for help. Why did they wait so long to turn to the Lord? Do you have an answer to that one? Because they were a lot like us. That's why they waited so long. Just like we did. Sometimes we know the answer, but we just wait, 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 and wait, and looking for some other way to get out of it. Sometimes you can't get out of it. Why did they wait so long to turn to the Lord? Because they're a lot like us today. They waited until every possible option played out, and they couldn't take it any longer. Verse 6 tells us that Israel became probably stricken because of Midian. And the Israelites cried out to the Lord, How many times have hard circumstances come to us that we never stop to ask for what God is planning for us to do? Learn this from Gideon. Every experience of life is a trust. 
and every trial in the lives of God's people is tailored to draw us closer to God. Yeah. When everything's going good, who do we praise? Do we praise ourselves because I did everything right? Do we praise the guy that helps us do everything right? We're nothing without God. And you need to understand, God made us from the sand of the earth, the dirt of the earth. All the praise is God. Hmm? I said all the praise is to God. I praise him every morning for letting me open my eyes. Amen. And every time my back hurts, I know I'm alive. Stop the praising for the little things too, like a cup, yeah. like a cup of coffee. How many people would love to have a cup of coffee and sit down and enjoy it? It's a lot of people can't afford a cup of coffee to sit down and enjoy it. That's right. Little things like that, you think for all kinds of little kind of things. How often? How many things could we write down that we take for granted, just in a day? Like getting up, going to the car, going to the grocery store. I mean, those we take for granted. We don't take time to say, well, Lord, thank you for giving me the money to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. um, it's stuff like that people just do so often they take it for granted. There was an old saying I heard a long time ago, stop and smell the roses. Watch for the bees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because people don't have time to even see the roses, let really alone stop and smell them. <laughs> when you get up in the morning, your heart's beating. You take your first breath. God gives you that breath. God gives you every breath. He gives you every heartbeat. Your life can stop in one breath and one heartbeat. You exist no more. You need to be ready. Because eventually we're all going to pass away. And that's the Lord God before we die. God sees more than we do. The wonderful thing about God is that even though we're slow returning to Him, He is never slow responding to us. Verses 7 and 8 shows that when we cry out to God, He moves in mercy and love toward us. He tells us the truth and begins to work behind the scenes to help us. For Israel, His first sent an unnamed prophet to call them back to total surrender and full devotion. I was thinking I had some more pages here. Got me stuck. But his plan included mostly unlikely men named Gideon. We meet Gideon where he is threshing some wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. Now some of you know this, but the city boys like me don't. Normally you would want to thresh wheat out in the open so that the wind could blow through away the chaff. We've all read that in the Bible about threshing wheat, hitting it on the ground, flipping it up in the air so the wind will blow all the chaff out and, and the wheat falls to the ground. So anybody's farm didn't know a little bit about it. But Gideon was apparently been stung before. So he goes into hiding in an underground wine press, hoping to avert the attention of the Midianites. It's a pitiful sight, full of frustration, discouragement, and fear. See, many, uh, Gideon went down in the, to hide from the Midianites because the Midianites seen him threshing wheat. They were still running. So he tried to find him a place where he could get away from so they could see him while he was doing it. So that way he could probably save a little bit of wheat for future. <coughs> we, all, we all try to save for the future, don't we? But a lot of times what we save gets eat up on other things. You know, life sometimes can be cruel, but life sometimes can be good and prosperous. If you have enough love and understanding, you can get through about anything with God's help. So I was once sitting back in the back and I didn't understand the way of life. I just took everything for granted. But he opened my eyes and showed me the way. 
in case you ever wondered if God has a sense of humor, you know, every time I read that, there's a lot of things in the Bible that really, to me, was humorous. Like Jonah and the whale. So Jonah, God told Jonah to go to a certain place and do something. He didn't do it. He got on a ship and went the opposite direction. Because there come a big storm and everybody blamed the big storm on Jonah. So they picked him up and threw him overboard. So <laughs> this fish swallowed Jonah. And took him right back to where he was supposed to be. Three days he was in the belly of that fish praying. And God and the fish took the fish right back to the shores of where he was supposed to be in the first place. And the fish <laughs> pulled up on the floor and puked him out. Now to me that would have been awful comical. See that he sat there and that little fish pull up on the back, puke this guy out. He gets up barefoot and goes running towards the town. And that would be coming for the man. So I think the Lord does have a little humor. Then the angels of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Can't you imagine getting around with a man of battle? The Lord was suppressing. Was God being statistic? Sadistic? Or did he see more than Gideon saw? I believe God saw what he was about to make Gideon. It was time Gideon saw it too. God confirms his priorities with his presence. After being called a mighty warrior, Gideon's questions God. Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? And where are the wonders that our fathers told us about? 13. Gideon's conclusion was that the Lord has abandoned him. Verse 14. Record something that must have bulldozed Gideon's sensibilities. It said that the Lord turned to him, he lifted Gideon full in the face, and said, Go in the strength you have and deliver easier. Easy, deliver. Israel from the power of Gideon. Am I not sending you? Gideon still isn't doing the math in his divine equation. So he knows just how impressive his resume is. He is the weakest link in the clan, the youngest in the family. He doesn't have any authority to call out the cavalry from his own tribe, let anyone from others. So like I said, Gideon was just a, really a nobody. He had authority to do nothing, nobody paying kids to him, nobody listening to him. Just like that sometimes our kids do to us. God confirms his priorities with his presence in verse 16. I will be with you, the Lord said to him. You will strike Gideon down as if if it, it were one man. Gideon is given an undeniable commission, told the remarkable results in advance, and promised the unveiling partnership of the Lord himself. After further confession that he was in fact dealing with God himself, 22 tells us that he fell into place with Gideon. He cries out, Oh no, Lord God, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. His fears comfort his calling effect uh, firm, so he builds an altar to the Lord. Gideon needs a personal encounter with God. God met with him right where he was, giving him a sense of peace and purpose by his promised presence. It was said among Napoleon's soldiers, when Napoleon takes our hands and looks at us, we feel like conquerors. There's something that changes in us when we listen to his voice and look full in his wonderful face. Suddenly, his priorities become the most important things on earth. Okay, uh, Gideon was a nobody, but once he found the Lord, little by little, the Lord swayed him over, showed him how to get the soldier he was and everything, and he was going to help him do all this and do this, and Gideon's now starting to believe a little bit that he might be able to do that. He's getting a little bit of confidence. 
Gideon, Gideon was ready for his first test. And this is verse 25 through 32. Before Gideon can be used publicly, he must first clean up his own backyard. What book are you in, Dan? I'm in verse, it, it's his own. Uh, it was 25 through 32. This is a, uh, this is a breakdown of the verses. We didn't look through it with, with the Bible verses. Right, so where, where, where does it come from? Uh, it comes, uh, I take the verses of the King James Bible. I go in and I break down the verses, and it gives me, it explains the verse by verse by verse by verse, what the verse really means. So therefore, I'm just reading this because it's not in the Bible. It's a breakdown of the verses that's in the Bible. You follow me on that? Well, I'm trying to understand, but I don't understand where it came from. In other words, uh, the private full faithfulness and privilege of public use, and that is chapter 6, and this is Verse 25 through 32. This is breaking down 25 through 32 in a line. Is what it's doing. In other words, it's uh, put in more English where you can understand it better. But what book is it coming out of? It, it comes off the uh, internet. It's where the preacher is doing and break all these verses down. So the people can understand it better. Am I not working? Yeah. In, in a sense you are, but otherwise I don't, I don't know if it's not Because if you can't follow me, it's hard to follow it, man. Right. Oh, okay, I got you in there. But just like this one right there, that one right there was uh, verse 25 to 32, and the next one here is uh, 33 through 40, and then the next one is, uh, next one would be the conclusion of that chapter. Does anybody else have a problem understanding what chapter are you on now? Are you on 7, 8, 6? Right now I'm on the Bible. It's in chapter 25 through 32 right now. Are we on 7, 25? It's not in the Bible. It's in chapter 6. Okay, that's why, yeah. And it's verse 25 through 32. Okay. It's a breakdown of 25 to 32 going straight through 25 to 32. I tell you basically what it, it means and what's going on here, and what's happening and what's coming out of it. And it talks about Gideon, how he defeats his army. And what is really going to be funny is how he defeats the army. So I'll uh, back to 25 through 32. Before Gideon, Gideon can be publicity, he must first clean up his own backyard. Now this one here is uh, one of the meanings in here. Before you can help God, you've got to straighten yourself out. Does that make sense? In other words, if you look in the mirror and you see something you don't like, straighten it out. Mm -hmm. We all got problems. We all do things wrong. We're human. And the Bible teaches us all along that we're going to make mistakes every day. And we need to ask for forgiveness every day for these mistakes. So um, if I'm confusing you, then I'm doing something wrong with this message. What's the point of telling us this? If you want to learn how God, how to trust God, you must first set your own house in order. That's common sense, I guess. Before God can use you, Mightily, he must be magnified in your own life, in your own home, private workplace, preparedness for perfect power from God. There are no shortcuts. So, is there anything you've been holding on to? Is there any sin that you are clinging to? Knock down the idol, knock down your idol, confess your sin, deal with it, and return to the full obedience of God. Now, if you look through that, there's so much that we do wrong because there's so much that we don't understand. There's so much in the Bible that we haven't read. I make mistakes every day. I don't deny it, I do. I'm not perfect with, perfect with anything. I don't claim to be perfect and don't want to be perfect because the person that says he's perfect is a liar. 
Nobody's perfect. So let's go ahead and go to God is patient with our pace processes. This will be verse 33 through 40. If this were a movie, we got to, this is verse 33, ominous music would be playing. It would say the many dykes and their partners are getting ready to make their annual raid. So now, they, just like it's in the verses there, they're going to raid the Israelites. But instead of cleaning in a cave, verse 34, says the Spirit of the Lord invoked and felt Gideon, and he blew the ram's horn and the Abidianites rallied behind him. Gideon has taken a huge step of faith in his private faithfulness, and now God's Spirit was drawing people from far and wide. 32,000 men show up ready to fight. Now this is very important. Gideon's done raised up from nobody to somebody. And when he blew the trumpet for war, very important to remember this, 32,000 men showed up to fight. How many was left? Yeah. How many was left after those 32,000 showed up? We're getting there. We're getting there. Yeah. But watch this. Even after the encounter with the Almighty God, even though he had been obedient to clean the shop at home, and even though the Holy Spirit has empowered him, Gideon still struggled with doubts. He knew that God has promised to save Israel through him. But if he's looking at the minor and the reflection he sees doesn't look encouraging. Okay. Gideon says to the Lord, if you will deliver Israel by my hand, as I said, verse 37, I will put a fleece of wool here on the threshing floor. It drew is only on the fleece. That's what we said. And on the ground is dry. I will know that you will deliver Israel by my strength, as you said. Now here he is again. Now he's testing God again. With that fleece again. I love how loving, tender, and patient God is with us. Gideon is making a deal with God. He wants to confirm, confirm his sign. And the Bible says, the next morning, God gave it him. The fleece was wet and the ground was dry. Even in the doubting Thomas, as the OT reversed the test, verse 39, asking that the fleece be dry and the ground be covered with dew, God graciously confirmed his power to Gideon. Our Lord was develop, developing this man into a full, convinced servant, matching each doubt with kindness and reassurance. God will show us he has the same patience as well as you seek his face, his spirit to grow, you to the man or the woman of God. You know, a lot of times we ask God to do something. And God will do it for us. And we'll understand that He done it for us. Because it can be done no way by God. And then a few days, a few days down the road, how do, how do we always forget so quick? We do, don't we? We can see a miracle in front of our face and go down the road. And there's so much out in the world that distracts us that we lose sight of what we're looking at. Now this next one right here is a verse, this goes chapter 7, 1 through 8. It's about ready to get good here. Gideon is ready to rumble, for God has other plans in Judges 7, 2. The Lord said to Gideon, uh, the Lord said to Gideon, You have too many people for me to hand the Midianites over to you. Now, he's got 32,000 people, and many of the has got way more than he got. Now, God's telling me he's got too many men. God proceeds to give Gideon a couple of tests to whittle the number down. The first test is called, first test called 22,000 men out of the army. Okay, 22,000 will take out. Now leaving Gideon with 10,000. 
have to think about that, Danny. Mm -hmm. On that verse, we're skipping over to some stuff that's really important in that verse. Uh -huh. He said, There are too many for of us to do it. But he tells them, Now I want you to go forward to plain the ears of the people, those that are fearful and afraid. Mm -hmm. to leave. You leave, yes. yes. That, that's important that we that you know. And that wasn't put in that very bad. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, in verse 4, a second test was given. God tells Gideon to take his men down to the water and let them drink. Weed out any men who stick their faces down into the water to drink, keeping the ones who ladder the water into their mouths with their hands. Okay? So he took 10,000 down the river to get a drink of water. The ones that took their hands and put down in the water and picked it up and drank. He was to keep. And the ones that got down on their hands and knees and been over and drunk, he didn't keep. So he went from 10,000, I think it was down to 200. Right, but Was it down to 200 he got? Three got Three got It doesn't say how many. Okay, verse 4. The second test was given and the men went down to the river to drink. Okay, we don't do that. Yeah, but he's only 300 men, yeah. So 970 went out. Can you imagine how Gideon felt at chapter 8? He tells us that the Midianite army numbered 135,000 men. Now Gideon is down to 300. What do you think about that? It makes you, make you wonder, wouldn't it? Mm hmm. It is such a thing. That's 450 Midianites to every one Israel soldier. 450 to one. God wants Gideon's army to face this war with a mere 300 men who know how to drink politely. <laughs> okay, God created an impossible situation of the human weakness to exalt his own strength. Now that's what God did. He wants his 300 men army to go up there and face 135,000 army. But with God's with you, you can do it. Imagine that. You can do it with God's help. How much can we do with God's help? Well, the Bible says that the face the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can command the mountain to move and it will move. Nothing's impossible. God created an impossible situation of human weakness to exalt his own strength. This is his fatality. What did Jesus say in Luke 18, 27? What is impossible with men is possible with God. Here's a good lesson for us. Accomplishing God's purpose is not determined by the bottom line or the finance sheet or the size of the congregation or the efficiency of a plan. We need to attempt all those things sure. Now what were the good times we need to be? That is conclusion. It happened in Israel in one of the strangest battles that is in history. The 300 went out with trumpets, torches, and jars and met the watering of monodites. God sent confusion into the ranks of the enemy so that they began to attack each other. When it was over, 120,000 Midianites had killed one another, and the other 1,500 fled. They fought each other. God turned them against each other. So the 300 they didn't have to fight, they killed each other. So amazing. Isn't it? It was over, God had answered Israel's prayer, and he used a common man to believe God. In other words, what we're saying, God uses tough times to get our attention. God always seems more than we do. Do you see yourself as he does? God confirms his priorities with his presence. 
Can you sense his presence with you now, urging you to trust him? Pride of faithfulness in a preparation of to public usefulness. Are there things in your life, in your home, that you need to go so God can move the power in your life? God is patient with our faith process. He needs to run for you all with what you need. You know, that was just something I read, and it was just a little interesting. And I'm sorry if I got it in a form that you didn't understand, you guys. Well, I'm just curious what was kind of on this. Yeah, it was, we read the verses first, and then it went down, and then what it did was that. Uh, it's uh, just like, you might as well say, like the New King James Bible, we broke it down into understanding where you could understand verse by verse by, by what it read in the Bible. So a lot of these verses, I'm not good at breaking down myself because I don't understand a lot of them. So I cross reference in other books to get the answers I need to make me understand the verse better. But that's about all I've got right here for now. The computer, King James. Yeah. It goes in there and finds the, the Bible, the King James verses. Then it goes in there and it has the Somebody to break down the verse. What you have to be careful about that is the interpretation. The interpretation. That you got to be so careful with the interpretation. Yeah. But more or less, I go through and I read on all of it before I teach on it. But like I say, I'm not really great at the verses. I don't understand a lot of them. Some of them pretty complicated to me. And I'm not into the Bible that deeply. I've only been teaching for a little bit. I got so much to learn. And so much you all can teach me when I make a mistake. Well, so I try to get the point. Of, the point's the main thing to get the point across. To what it really means. I think a lot of times it's sometimes it's hard to get there with the verses you know, you're reading the Bible to understand. But a lot of times just getting the point across the meaning. The outcome comes out right. Like. Well, okay, like David, I think you're preaching. Danny Holmes, let's, let's understand here. Okay. What Danny is like, you take, let me just kind oh, of. Sure. Like here in, in, in 36, he said, And Gideon said unto him, Thou wilt save me from my hand, as thou hast, as thou hast said. So mm -hmm. he's telling Gideon, or, or God, if you could save me from by my hand, I'm telling you, this is this is what, what I'm gonna do. Yeah, and he goes down and he says, Behold, I will put police on the floor and do them. Um, the police will only be on the floor on the police on dry ground. Mm -hmm. So he's made him a promise there. He said, yeah. Okay, look, I'm gonna put do on that police. Everything around is gonna be dry. Sure. So that this is a promise he made. Him. Well then he says, Well, that's not good enough. Yeah, he doesn't believe it. Right. Let me mm -hmm. put do, do it on the ground and not on the plate. He, the he had to do it for you twice. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying? It, 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 it's just something that just uh, uh, it's hard to explain. Sometimes it's more strange as believing. Yeah. But it, and sometimes you gotta see it more than once. Just take it just take it as it is. You have to, yes. That's, that's all you can do about it. But God must be very understanding and patient with us too. What's he telling us a reasonable mm -hmm. He took a simple person and defeated a whole army with one simple person. And even though Gideon, Gideon, Gideon did not believe God fully, he had to get so many tests for him to understand. Yet God was patient with him and understanding and did all these tests to prove to Gideon that he was who he was. That's what kind of God we have. He's patient. He's understanding. He loves us. You know, sometimes we have to sit down with one of our children. We have to show them something two or three times before we get them to understand exactly what it is. That comes from our patience as being a parent. And we are just like children in God. <coughs> you know, God takes care of us. And he teaches us the way he knows, the right way, even though we believe in different ways. So a lot of times a person just Got to see it to believe it. They don't believe anything they hear. Anymore, you can't hardly believe anything they hear. It's hard. Okay, David, I'll let you come down and take over.
Good morning. Good morning. Everyone looks well. So I'd like to start today with the passage out of 1 Corinthians in the second chapter. And Paul wrote this. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. The world is in trouble. The world is passing away in the lust thereof. We are to seek the kingdom first. Man is further away from God than he's ever been, and it shows. And much like the church, America is in the same situation. America was founded by men that loved the Lord. The church was founded by men that loved the Lord. They're both being attacked from the outside and the inside. Let's have a moment of prayer before we begin today's message. Our gracious and holy heavenly Father, <coughs> Lord, we're gathered here as your church, as the body of your Lamb. Lord, we see the agony in this world. We see the decay that's overtaking man and his heart. Lord, we ask you as your believers to pour your wisdom out upon every heart here this morning. Lord, you said if we ask, you would give it abundantly. Lord, we ask humbly. Lord, we ask that you lead us and help us to understand when, as your people, we need to stand up in your name and speak, and when we need to sit and be silent. Lord, we need your guidance. We need your love. And we do know, because we understand that Jesus is the Christ, that no matter what happens in this world, we will endure and be saved by the sacrifice of the Lamb. We love you and we thank you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This gospel... This gospel, it will save your soul. It saved mine. It will save the souls of your family. It will save the souls of your friends. It will save the souls of people you don't even know. Jesus Christ went to the cross to do the work of the Father. He said those who do the work of the Father are his mother and his brother and his sister. That's what we're here for. We're not here to serve ourselves. We're here to serve others. Amen. You know, my family and I were very happy to be back today. Um, it's been almost a year since we brought the message here at Elk Valley, and it's, it's an absolute pleasure to, to be here. You know, as believers, we all have something to look forward to. One day... The King of Glory will step out on the cloud. And he will let two things happen. The Lord, when he returns, he's going to come and do something. But he's also going to come and take something. What he's going to do, according to the books of Acts and Psalms, he's going to judge this world in righteousness. Because this is an unrighteous world. It's a cursed world. The book of Romans tells us the wrath of God will be revealed upon those who hold the truth in unrighteousness. These people that we see that deny the Lord, both by word and action, we must love them. We must shine the light of Christ upon them through us. We must allow Jesus to manifest through us unto them. The tragedy of being in that day and the Lord telling you to depart. Uh, no Christian heart could ever be okay with that happening to anybody. Ever. But this gospel, the Lord tells us in the book of Hosea, Hosea 4 and 6, he says, Many of his people will be lost. 
They reject knowledge, he rejects them. Here's our knowledge. God has a beautiful, perfect plan for each one of us. Here's the instruction manual. James 1 and 22 says, if you hear the word only and not do the word, you've deceived yourself. John wrote in Revelation 12, 9 that the devil, the old serpent, he will deceive the whole world. Don't help him deceive the world by deceiving yourself. When we read this and we're bothered, that's good. We have to read the gospel that bothers us. The world has contaminated our mind into thinking a certain way. This is the truth. Somebody once said it's easy to fool people, but once they've been fooled, it's nearly impossible to get them to see the truth after that. This right here is the truth. When we read the gospel that bothers us, maybe the gospel that hurts our feelings, maybe the gospel that we intellectually disagree with, a beautiful thing happens, and it's a blessing from the Almighty himself. What happens to us is we're convicted. <coughs> you cannot find repentance without true conviction. Why would you ever repent of your sin if you didn't realize you were wrong? Conviction leads to repentance. Repentance leads to salvation. The first thing Jesus said to us in the Gospel of Mark, the time is fulfilled. Repent ye. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Not believe the gospel that feels good. Not believe the gospel you like to hear. We all love to come to church. We all love to get a feel-good message. Makes us feel better about our salvation, and that's great. Sixty-six books written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors. Everybody from a fisherman to a physician. This is the truth. Every single word. Even the parts that hurt. We are here in the Lord's house this morning. We have people who are members of this church family right now who are going through some tough stuff. This church is where we all come away from the world. The things of the world are not allowed here. This is where we come to love, nurture, grow. Iron sharpens iron, the Bible says and learn about the truth. This is his house before it's our church. He always gets preeminence. It doesn't matter our feelings. It doesn't matter our opinions. Do you know why it's so important to God that we love him wholeheartedly out of our free will. Now, God will never trespass on your free will. God will never force you to love him. He never will. The reason God cherishes so much us to worship him out of our free will is because he loves us enough that he knows this. Nothing else, period, can we worship and devote ourselves to that will not eventually lead us to despair. God is the only thing we can worship that will never, ever, ever let us down or lead us to destruction. Amen. And that's big. That's big. Jesus Christ, on that bloody, brutal cross, he said seven things, but he made one promise. On that cross, he promised this. 
if we abandon and reject our allegiance to the sin of this world, we can be forgiven. We can be sanctified. And we can be reconciled to the Father. <coughs> Think about that. To stand in that day with the King of Kings, with the one we've read about so long, the one who worked miracles, the one who was beaten, they tried to humiliate him. He went through all of this when he had more than 12 legions of, 12 legions of angels on standby to stop it all, but he didn't. We get to stand in his holy presence and the highest of all kings welcomes us in. He said, you did well. Come and die. Come and die. The place in here that he said he's going to go prepare for us, he's going to give it to us one day. Forever. The suffering of this world is over. We won't even have memories of Revelation 21 4. The Lord will wipe the tears from our eyes. Death will be no more. Death is the last enemy. Jesus holds the keys of death and hell. That's what he said. That's what he said. Being convicted is a blessing. We cannot be convicted of our sin without the presence and the actions of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Bible says. The Holy Spirit will reprove the world of its sin. When you are convicted, that is telltale proof positive that the Holy Spirit is working in you. To bring you closer to your sanctification. It's much like forgiveness. You ever forgiven somebody? We, because our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked, we cannot forgive someone on our own. Because before Christ, we're walking in the flesh. The flesh doesn't forgive anybody. The flesh seeks revenge. The flesh seeks to murder someone with their tongue. The flesh seeks pure condemnation on those it doesn't like. But, but, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, when the Lord comes upon you, we can forgive, but we can't forgive without Him. We cannot overcome without Him. To overcome any sin, great or small, is proof positive that the Lord is at work in us. We can only overcome because he overcame. We can't overcome by ourselves if we could. We wouldn't need this. We could just do it on our own, right? But the question is, why are we here? That's a great question people ask. Well, why are we here? I haven't done anything with my life. Well, there's two parts to that. We're here primarily to worship, honor, and glorify God in the life and the being that he's given us. But secondly, <coughs> think about this. When the Lord looked down upon Nineveh, he looked over and saw Jonah. When he looked over and saw Goliath, well, he looked over and saw David. When he looked over and saw the Israelites, he looked over and saw Moses. But Moses said... I cannot speak in a way to lead your people. The Lord said, fine, I'm going to stick your brother with you. Now Aaron can go and help you, and y'all can do it together. Here's the question. What was the Lord looking at when he looked over and saw you? What did he put you here for? He created all this. He didn't just make you because he didn't have anything to do. Why are we here? Why are you here? Like uh, Butch said earlier, sometimes we entertain angels unaware. Is it possible that maybe we've served our purpose in his plan? And maybe we didn't even know we did it. Maybe a kind word to someone one day kept that person from hurting themselves. 
And then that person got converted. Who knows? We have carnal minds trying to understand the creator of all the universe. Do we understand why? With John 16, for God so loved the world, he gave us his only begotten son. Do we understand why, even though God loved the world, the world hates Jesus? Do we understand why? John 7 and 7 gives us the answer to that. Jesus said, the world hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil. Not bad or naughty, not contentious, evil. Okay? When you tell someone their ways are evil, you convict that person. Maybe not you or me because they would just think we're hypocrites because we're sinners too. When the most perfect, righteous man in existence, the only one ever, tells the dark world how dark and evil they are, they don't want to be convicted. Man's heart before conversion loves sin. The world loves sin. That's why the world's not allowed in here. Because when the world comes through the door, the sin comes with it. We get in a place in life. Going back to James 1.22. Be a hearer of the word only and not a doer when we deceive ourselves. God's plan for us is to live in the present. Okay? This is a very big point here. When we look back, when we look ahead, we're not in the present. When we're not in the present, we're not available for the Lord to lead us and have his way in us. When we look back, now the Bible says, um, you take your hands off the plow and look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. We also remember Lot's wife. They were leaving, she looked back. After she was told, don't look back. When the Lord tells you it's time to move on, it's time to move on. What we need to do in these moments, because this destroys a lot of people, we have a memory that is only supposed to be used to look back to where the Lord brought us from. When we look back and we're sitting here looking back and we're talking about yesterday and yesteryear and we're just stuck back here, the devil gets involved, 90% of what we're looking back on is bad stuff that hurt us. Okay? I'm not sure there's anybody in here that's not been hurt somewhere in her past by somebody. Okay? When it's over, it's over. The Lord loves us enough to move us forward. Don't look back. Matthew 6 says, give no thought for tomorrow. Don't look ahead. Today has enough troubles. Today has enough troubles. When we get stuck in yesterday, yesteryear, whatever's going on back here, and we start dwelling on all of this bad stuff, then we have another problem. We have to figure out if we can forgive what's happened. Because if we look back here at people that hurt us, traumatic events, whether we brought it on ourselves or it just happened without any of our control, when we get stuck back here, we get in situations where we have to find forgiveness for people that did really hurtful things to us. You know, people want to say there's a joy in, in serving the Lord, and there is, don't get me wrong. But the thing people don't want to say out loud is following Christ is possibly the hardest thing you want to do. We have to forgive people who did horrible things to us that are not only not sorry, they do it again if they had a chance. You've got to find forgiveness for those people. Jesus did. First thing he said on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Okay? Matthew 6, after the Messiah himself, after Jesus Christ taught us how to pray, first thing he mentioned, first thing he talked about, forgive them. <coughs> 
when we have a hurtful past that we have not forgiven, we end up bitter, broken, hard-hearted, contentious, and just an overall unhappy person. But here's the good news. The Bible says, whom the Son makes free is free indeed. Yes, we're free from sin. But we're also free from the brokenheartedness. We're free from the anger. We're free from the bitterness. He loves us enough that he said, any man who comes to me, I will by no wise cast him out. Cast your cares on me. I care for you. Bring your bitterness. Bring your anger. And put it at the foot of the cross. And I will bear it for you. And you, my child, can walk on with a free heart. That's what he'll do for us. And I know because I've lived it. That lady right there, the Lord used her to take that yoke of bitterness off of me years ago. And he did. He freed me. When you get rid of that forgiveness issue that you have behind you, that's why the Bible says, don't look back. But we're human. We're rebellious. The Lord knows this. But someday somebody will tell you, the Bible says, don't look back. It's what it says. It's what it means. Just loading yourself back up with the burden again. Well, Lot's wife was not a bad lady. When the Lord says, don't look back, it's time to move on. Don't look back, it's time to move on. Sometimes in life, it is the cross before the crown. Sometimes, just like Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus suffered for us, and therefore, God left us an example. Jesus did no wrong. He was innocent. The Bible says there was no guile found in his mouth. And yet you look at what they did to him. He didn't deserve it. But he gave us an example. Sometimes it is the cross before the crown. Sometimes you do have to suffer unfairly, unjustly. The poor me boo-hoo stuff. I never read in there where Jesus said that one time. Jesus never said, poor me. When he was hanging on that cross, he looked up and said, it's finished. I did what you sent me here for, Dad. Father, it's finished. When he was in his hymn and he prayed, Father, pass this cup if it be your will. He was a man. He was in the flesh. He didn't want to go to the cross. But I'll tell you what, we talk about the past and, and bad things that happened to us. All suffering is not bad. Okay? And I'll give you, I'll give you a case in point. The, the two thieves on the cross, one repented and one didn't. The one that did repent, God knew the only way that man would find salvation is he was going to have to get hung on the cross behind the king of kings. You think that guy wanted to get hung on the cross? Not a Roman cross back in those days. That is, being on the cross back then is nothing but slow suffocation. You're out there in 120 degree weather, and it's basically like somebody's got their hands around your throat and they're slowly chucking you out. Miserable, painful, agonizing. That man had to go to that cross in order to meet Jesus. You know, you see people out here and they, they have their little cross necklaces on and, you know, they'll throw you some scripture out and, you know, then you see what they do and they're not being very upright, I guess, in some of their words and some of their actions. And, and what that led me to think is there's a lot of people in the world, the Bible says, honor me with thy lips, but thy heart is far from me. There's a lot of people in the world, they want to wear that cross they just don't want to bear that cross. Suffering for him is, as the Bible says, something to rejoice in. If you are persecuted for my name's sake, rejoice in it. Rejoice in it.
Jesus Christ carried his cross through the streets of Jerusalem for one reason. The work of the Father. The work of the Father means that we get to go home one day. We get to go home. All this foolishness out here You know, these, these churches, man. When the Lord comes back, he's coming back for one thing. He's only taking one thing out of here. The Bible says the elements will burn away with fervent heat. The earth and the works thereof will burn up. <coughs> one thing is getting saved. The, the bride, the church. But not the church building. He's only coming back for those who truly love him. Once again, when the book of James 1 and 22 says, if you're a hearer of the word only and not a doer, you've deceived yourself. We have it all, family. We've been given a salvation that no one can take from us. The devil can't take it. The world can't take it. Your brother-in-law you don't like can't take it. The only way you can lose it is if you give it away. Most people would never give it away. So the devil comes along to deceive you into giving it away. He will make you think. See, and that's the difference between being convicted by the Holy Spirit and being accused by the devil. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. When you feel like you're so bad that you can never have salvation, when you get those little thoughts in your head that say you're beyond help, the Lord will never have anything to do with you. That's not conviction. That's the devil accusing you. That's also what the devil does when you're stuck back here with the trauma. He throws it up over and over and over and over. If he can keep your mind spinning back here on the pain and agony, the Lord has a real hard time working his way in you. Bible said when Jesus was in Nazareth, there was so little faith to be found that he could do no great work there. Our hearts are the same way. When we're so beat up by the hardships of yesterday that it's hardened our hearts in bitterness, we're closing the door. The Lord's knocking, but we're just not opening. And that's the truth. Family, I love each and every one of you all. This right here, this right here, family, instruction manual to our salvation. The book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 20, says, There will come a day. When all men will be without excuse. Don't let yourself get to that day. We don't know. Like I think Brother Butch said earlier. We don't know if we're going to have dinner tonight. All we know is we have right now, right here. We're in the house of the Lord. We're come together as a family of God. We are the peculiar people that he separated from the world. And he said, don't be like a dog and return to your vomit. We've got to leave yesterday behind us. We've got to not worry about tomorrow. We've got to be present. We have to love our conviction. We have to stay in the word. And we have to be sincere. With that said, I guess we'll bring old Sparky up. You're trying to do a good job.